So Susan. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I was born in Gisborne in 1960. My parents um, leased some land in Manatuke, Gisborne, just on the outskirts of Gisborne, a predominantly Māori community. So they worked on the market garden, and when I grew up, I worked on the market garden day in and day out, you know, one plant, one hole, one plant, rows and rows. And when I was of age, I went to school at Manatuke Primary School, which was a predominantly Māori you know, populated school with a few Europeans that were farmers. And I was the only Chinese student, but we all got on along really fine. We all got on well. And in my primary years, I sort of just did school, you know, all this learning, you know, ABC, spelling, you name it. We had after school, you know, tennis, rugby, whatever people played. Or, but me, I couldn't stay behind and play games, so I had to go home and work on the market garden. So, you know, when we broke for school at three o'clock, I was expected home, because, you know, we had to put food on the table, and my parents worked really hard, and I did too. The school was actually separated between our land and our market garden and the school, so I used to walk across the domain every day to school, which was handy. Unless I wanted to go to the shop in the morning, I'd walk down the road to the corner dairy. I did my primary school years there. After primary school, I went to Court Lytton High School. Just hard ass in the garden, you know, using dibble, dibblers with a um, pointed and they made out of wood. So you used, you held, held them and just, pl if you were planting cabbages or plants, you had rows. Sometimes we would harvest the vegetables, so we would pack vegetables, you know, all the vegetables that you can think of that we grew ready for market. Use apple boxes for putting the vegetables in and you there was a there was a method of putting in vegetables into a crate. So every cabbage that we had had to be folded, put nicely into the box. Um, later on we got these big boxes, they were called five star boxes. And to lift that box up on your shoulders as a nine year old kid was hard work and so but we did that every day or every week anything creative that I wanted to try didn't even enter my mind when I was at school sorry, my focus was getting an education and one day being a top flight PA I had this thing that I wanted to be a top flight PA or a shorthand writer and I started shorthand writing before I got to high school and I used to sit in the corner at the end of our corridor in our big old house and practice shorthand forms. And I would play teacher and student in the shorthand books and sit there and do my writing. So I gave myself a couple of years head start before I got to high school. I did that off my own back. I didn't want to grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. So it wasn't actually later on in the years that my market gardening journey inspired my first lot of glasswork. But when I left high school, I came up to Auckland and got a job as a junior secretary. It's very exciting. And I worked for this company that did big, huge laundry machines, you know, washing machines. And I worked in the service department for this guy from the UK. And of course, it was my first job. And I had to prove myself. And it was extremely difficult when I had no experience. But I knew that I could do the work because I'd practice, you know, for years. And so every time the service manager called me in to take a letter, it was no problem. Take the letter down in shorthand, type it up, get him to sign it. It was really easy. So that transition wasn't hard for me. And I worked there for about a year. Then I moved to another place to work. Just got more experience doing, you know, that secretarial stuff. Um, so I did that secretarial stuff for quite some time. I was right into it. You know, I was going to be a top PA. To me, that was prestige, you know, rather than being a doctor or a lawyer. But that's where my focus. So I kind of did that and I really enjoyed it. One day when I applied for a job as the general manager of the Gisborne Hospital as his PA, it was just amazing. I was like, shit. And when you get a job like that, you're in the public eye. Your boss is in the public eye. You're working for public service. Being a PA for somebody like that, you have to be very careful where people can see you because you represent your boss who is the boss of a public hospital. I did all the things that I wanted to do, you know, I did up a house, you know, I started painting. So I just did my, I just did this creative stuff that I never thought I could do. 
Mm -hmm. I love colour. I love everything that's bright. Everything's bright better than brown and black. And I just like the whole idea of rainbow colours. I like the idea about how colour changes your mood, changes others' mood. When I first started, any, I didn't paint as in like a painter. I was right into gardening. When I lived in the city, um, my, my, me and my then partner bought a house and I dug up the whole backyard and I made a garden, um, a cottage garden, which was really in those days. And I built a hot house. I thought, well, I'm a market gardener. If I don't know how to build a hot house, there's something wrong with me. By this time, I was like 28, 29. My partner then, his brother had a farm and he had a whole lot of manuka on his farm. It's the most beautiful farm. So I go driving up to his farm and he supplies me with a saw, hand saw, not, you know, machine one, so that I can get all the young manuka that was going straight. And I was going to build a hot house. There was no two ways about it. I was going to build that bloody hot house and I want to have a shitload of plants for my beautiful garden, for my beautiful home. I chose the plants based on colour, based on some medicinal purposes and based on the shape of their petals and their forms. So yes, I did. I lugged those down the hill. Then I thought, right, now I have to decide how I'm going to build this hot house. It's not that hard. So I put in four posts at the back of the garage and I dug the holes by myself. I had to get some kind of material for the actual hot house. Uh, you know, you get to that point in your life, you say, I can do this. And all of a sudden, I had all this, I had a half hot house that I just built. Oh, this is cool. And then I had to make the roof. I got what I was, I got all this manuka steak. I thought, right, all I need to do is get up there and weave, you know, weave the manuka steaks into the roof. The roof was on, I put the rest of the plastic on, and voila. And then I had this tiny little hot house. It had a door. I thought, I need a door. So what I do now is I make a wax model. Um, I use a lot of different moulds and master moulds. So I take, sometimes I take a master mould of a form, um, any type of form, like a bowl, and I'll make a master mould um, upside down. And then I end up with a master mould like that, which is what I did. I did this bowl, and it's a ceramic bowl. So I did a master mould of it so that I can make waxes. Of course, you know, bowl forms are not unique in themselves. The funniest thing is when I was in primary school and high school, I used to always love glass, glass bottles. Um, I really like those dark brown, um, I think they're called curry, and I always still always like them. I didn't like their form, but I like drinking out of glass. I preferred drinking out of glass because we always had glasses at home. The only time I did anything creative in the market gardening was getting little bits of dirt and putting water in it and making like clay and doing little pinch pots. I told it, you know, they had no form, they had no thought, but I used to put them on this big piece of rock outside our garage to dry. And then I would end up with these little clay things. That may have been my beginning, I don't really know. I just wanted to try. You know, you have dirt around, you've got to play. And um, that was my first probably foray. I think that what happened was that I did my career as a PA, and one day I had a job when I was living out in Waiuku because um, I moved to Pukekoe and yeah I had breast cancer in 2006 and I had worked that year for Sculpture on Shore and I wouldn't let, I applied to go into Sculpture on Shore through a lady by the name of Helen Shamroth and I had a studio in Penrose with some other glass cast artists and I wanted to do something really nice and I thought well I live in Auckland I've, you know I'm living in Anahanga there's a papaya tree so I thought oh, I'll just call this piece papayas in Auckland and I submitted my waxes they weren't in glass but in wax forms and I made these leaves papaya leaves I made these and I made this little installation and I got a big huge piece of roll of white paper and took all these photos and submitted it to Sculpture on Shore to the curator they said yes we would love to have your work and the news came while I was in hospital during having my breast cancer surgery. A hospital, I had to work and I had this exhibition that I had to get ready for and delivered in November. And by this time, it was like August and casting glass takes a very long time. 
and it's quite a process. The good thing is I was already prepared because I'd already made the wax models which I'd sent photos so I was kind of halfway there. That was the year that um, I was in Sculpture on Shore and Asia Down Under did an interview because they asked Helen if there were any Asian artists at Sculpture on Shore. By that time I had no hair. <laughs> I lost quite a bit of weight, um, which was a good thing, and had an interview at Sculpture on Shore, that was cool. From that point on, I just kind of carried on because I used to do stained glass. That was my first array into real glass art, was doing stained glass. I did that, and it was all about learning about copper foil, cutting glass sheet, how to put you know copper foil together, and lead lighting, you know. It's like, yeah, this is cool, so I went and did a workshop and I really loved it. All of a sudden had all these different coloured glass, you know, red, yellow, orange, you know, just all these beautiful things and we did these really cool projects. I loved it so much. I just loved how the light reflected through the glass. I liked how types of stained glass art, like birds, flowers, things like that, you know, when you place them in different light they shone differently and that's what really, really got me going. One year I made a sunflower and it was just a, just one of those spectrum free, free patterns that you get. You know, I wasn't really, or I'd do my own patterns. <laughs> and I did um, this amazing sunflower using this brown streaky glass, brown and white streaky glass for the heart of the sunflower. And then I cut out tiny little petals and sold it them all to her. It was just a nightmare, honestly. And then um, Andrea said to me, oh, you should put some of your copper foil work into the Oratea sculpture show you know when you start off you have this kind of low self-esteem you don't have any confidence because you think you're shit you know and then um anyway i took some work to the oratea sculpture show i put my price on wasn't much my sunflower sold within two hours of the sculpture show i was like wow so i got that money and i spent it all on glass you know that's what you do so i'll spend more money on glass you know make some more stuff and it was really cool and also at the time i was working as a quality assurance manager for a courier company Oh, don't go there, but that's what I did. And um, all the girls in the office, you know, in the call centre office wanted me to make them. Oh, can you make me a little dove, a stained glass dove? I'd like to put it on my mother's grave. And I made money, you know. I sold all these birds. Someone wanted me to make them a Tweety bird, made them that, you know. Then somebody wanted me to make them horses. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And then I started doing my own designs and started using agate. I just went crazy because it's kind of like, I can do this. And then I made this, um, I used this agate and it was kind of shaped like this. So I used this beautiful um, glass, it was beautiful, it was green and brown, but it was so beautiful and I, I soldered all that together and I called it embryo. And someone said to me, it's more, it's more like a sperm. I said, no, no, it's an embryo. I said, look, um, but you know, everyone's interpretation's different. I sold all those works. In 2005, I think it was, I had a solo exhibition. I had just recently done a course at Art Station on glass casting, and that's where I got hooked. You know, we went to class and we were given this block of plaster silica to carve. You know, that's three dimensional, and I'm used to two dimensions. So I thought, shit, what am I gonna do? And all these people around me started carving like, you know, ancient bloody, I gotta do what I can do. So I kind of did this, I thought, oh yeah, I'll just scrape around here and make that negative space. And then, so you know, I ended up with the square block that I carved out the side, and left the centre and um, I thought oh that might be a bit boring so basically I made a frame so I looked at this thing and I went oh I'll just put a few little slashes mark and I had made this cobalt blue frame that was kind of like this and when I pulled it out of the mould and scrubbed it clean it shone at me it was just the most beautiful thing in the world I was like oh my god this is so cool but the mould is so big and then I didn't stop I set up at home in my home garage and took over my partner's garage and I started making you know, vessels, you know, and then I moved into some like deco vessels, like triangular, which are really hard to do. I thought, but I'll give it a go. And I did that. And um, and then one day I was at an exhibition at a friend's, um, Sam. I had to find my theme. I had to find something that was real to me. And so I made up a little story about memories of sustenance which talks about my life growing up as a Chinese girl on a market garden in a predominantly Maori community. So I cast all these vegetables 
I made about 63 individual pieces of work in an installation. I had photos of my father and my mother on the back wall. It was an installation that no one had ever seen that kind of story being told. I think by that time I got to the point where I was either shit scared of being me and then it wasn't actually until I did that solo I was so focused. I worked till one o'clock in the morning every night in the studio to get what I wanted done because there was a method to my madness, like, what am I gonna do? Well, we used to hang the buckter on a fence. So my impetus for that was I lived at Manatuki in a market garden. We used to hang our buckter on the fence and the Maori kids used to walk past us and go, oh, what have those Chinese people got hanging? Not everyone can have. I'm very grateful because those connections and those people are actually what help you to actually trace yourself back to your whakapapa. It gives you that sense of your own tūranga waiwai, but you can do that and that it's okay because I involved those people. Glass pieces over to Mere, Mere Nepia, who was a pardo back then. I showed them my cast glass but glass glass but try and they went, Oh, is that what is this yeah, now you know. You know, we talk about manakitanga in this world quite a lot. But I don't believe that mani manakitanga is only for Māori. I think it should spread to all people, all Which cultures. Yeah, you have that rapport that's really natural and you don't have to pretend. You know, they've known your struggles, they've seen your life, good, bad, the ugly, and they accept you as you are. And you just think to yourself, the rest of the world should be like that. And it's, it's really great, that's what humanity is about, it's about peace. There is, has, has to be a lot of acceptance, but the world's so fucked up at the moment that we say one thing and we do another. You know, as they say, actions speak louder than words. So I try and live my life by, you know, my whanaunga tanga and spreading that kind of love. When I did my first solo exhibition, it was just so out there. Most challenging was probably my breast cancer. It was really scary. The thing is, when I was diagnosed with my breast cancer, I hadn't even looked after my health. I'd been busy doing glass, I've been busy organising conferences because I was on the committee of the New Zealand Society of Artists and Glasses at, to put on a conference, you know, it's a lot of work. And, I, and then one morning I, I, one morning I got out of bed, I didn't get out of bed, I was lying in bed thinking, oh, I should get up and go to work. And I thought, well, I should actually. So I'm lying there and I'm just like, oh, oh. Then I felt this lump, I went, oh, what's that? I mean, fuck, that's the size of a golf ball. And I freaked out. And it's like 7.30 in the morning and work was just up the road in Epsom. I was like, oh shit, I better ring the doctor. And I had a biopsy. This is all in like 24 hours. It's full on. So I did and it was malignant. You know, it was a breast cancer lump. And just organised um, my surgery um, and went to this really good looking doctor. He sat me down. And he says, <clears throat> the operation we're going to do for your breast reconstruction, because I didn't want, and when I went to see my surgeon, and he says, I want to show you some photos of the operation. He says, if it gets too much, just tell me and I'll turn the computer off. And he's got this operator's tram flap operation images. And I'm just like, right in front of the screen going, wow, heavy. I said, it's quite involved, isn't it? He said, imagine pushing stuffing underneath the chicken skin. He said, same philosophy. So there's 50K of boob here. That you can't feel but that's okay so I didn't have time to stop to think about what was happening so I didn't push away my feelings I just didn't have time to stop to play a victim I had a life and I had to get on and I also had already done my first solo exhibition in cast glass and I thought to myself if I die now at 45 I'm cater pie because I've had my first solo exhibition and that was my goal and if anything happens if I die at least I've done that and left some kind of legacy. And that's how I kind of went to that journey, did the Sculpture on Shore exhibition, met a young Japanese girl that came and did my cult, my polishing for me for Sculpture on Shore, because I was too sick, I couldn't do it. And she just came and did it for nothing. One of the best glass polishers I had. And she came over every Saturday morning to polish. So I'd give her some soup and some bread, you know, as you do. So without her help, I wouldn't have got the work done for Sculpture on Shore.
but I just got back into the garage and started just making some waxes. I got an invitation to a solo exhibition at my hometown museum and that was like, oh my god, this is real. Coming out of breast cancer, um, realising that it's okay to be Chinese, um, that I've got a story and I'm going to mix it up a little bit and tell the story about the Chinese and Māori through the yin and yang piece that I did. It was a great exhibition in a gallery. Yeah, and it was a really special occasion. First of all, you are privileged to be asked to go to your hometown. In New Zealand's most, the best regional museum there is in the country is Tauraafati Museum. And to be asked to exhibit there was a great honour for me. So I wanted to do it justice. So it took me two years to do all those first. And the thing is, I knew exactly what I wanted to say, what I wanted to do, what I was going to cast. I knew exactly where everything was going to go in the gallery. I saw Jolie the curator and I just dropped everything off. She had asked me to give her the dimensions of all my work because she built those plinth by herself because she had no funding. She had all the plinth bank. The exhibition was up. It was very emotional and as we start walking into the gallery, Dolly or one of the Koya ladies takes my arm. The other lady is in the gallery doing the karanga. Now that was a really spiritual moment for me. This karanga rang out from the Michael Chris Gallery. I'm certain the whole of Gisborne would have heard it. It was the most kind of beautiful but very eerie, you know, when 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 a karanga happens on a marae, it's really powerful. I said, oh yeah, this is this is this is happening. This is really cool. I was really excited, and she held onto my hand and she led halfway to the gallery. There was this freezing cold air on the heel of my feet, and I just like, what's that? I'm not someone that shakes. I don't shake and I don't get nervous, it's just not me. But I was really shaking, you know, I was walking and trying not to shake and this really cold air just came right from the heel of my feet and moved, it was freezing cold. Came right up here at the back of my calf, past my bum to the back here. By the time it reached the nape of my back, there was this beautiful warmth. From freezing cold to a beautiful warmth that seemed to embrace me. That defining moment where I got a little bit emotional, you know, so we're standing in the gallery and there's all these people. This, you know, the whole Chinese community's there. Lots of my friends I haven't seen there for years. Lots of people, artistic people, lots of people. It was packed. There was like no standing room. And all around the room, everyone was crying. And then Ming opened the exhibition with his um, korero, or fai korero. And um, it was really cool. And then Stan Pardo got up and said a few words. The little girl comes home. It was the most poignant moment of my life. And to be asked to exhibit in your hometown museum is a real honour and it's a real privilege and I wanted to do it justice. And of course, you know, in opening everything sort of happens, everyone's looking at your work and everyone wants to talk to the artists, you know, I don't actually want to talk to anyone. And then after a while, I just went out to the foyer to have a cup of tea. And then I'm sitting there and this man comes up to me and goes, are you Susan Lewin? I love it, I love it. And there was that one and only Giles Peterson. He's the creator of Age Pacific Art, so he represents art, uh, Pacific art all around the world. And he's a curator, he's really cool. Saying, oh my God, I've worked with Anne Robinson. Now Anne Robinson is the pioneer and doyen of cast glass in this country. I've worked with Elizabeth McClure, and oh no, there's all these glass glass. I was like, okay. And um, we just sat and had a little chat, and that was a really good exhibition. And I get an email about a week later from Jolene, the curator, and she goes, Jack Richards has just bought your big bowl of wealth and gifted it as a taonga to Tairawhiti Museum. I was like, Professor Jack Richards is a philanthropist for a lot of um, music, you know, um, orchestras, music, symphony, and but he's got the largest lali glass collection in the world and he doesn't have any New Zealand glass artist glass. And I was like, oh my God. It, not achievement, but it was kind of like, you get my story. That's what it was, because the bowl of wealth represented all these other bowls like love, joy, love, love. The wealth bowl actually didn't mean wealth in money terms, but your wealth and your richness in your heart, in your mind, in your body, in your soul, because there's more to riches than money. So that bowl of wealth wasn't about money, and it just had the Chinese word wealth carved into the side. Beautiful bowl. I think it's the most beautiful bowl I've ever made. I should make another one, and I will one day. And I will one day. I've still got the mould, so I'll be able to make one. How to be good to people. How to be compassionate. How to understand. How to love. And how to not judge. 
how to not judge others because when we judge others we judge something deep down inside that we don't like people do it every day I do it sometimes and I'm really conscious of it so you know and plus I also practice you know I practice Nietzsche and Daishon and Buddhism that's very important in my life and you know through that Buddhist practice I learn about myself I learn about looking in the mirror when you bow to the mirror the mirror bows back if you bow to the mirror really ugly the mirror is going to bow back to you ugly so you know it's a, it's a bit of a concept thing that I have because my Buddhist practice plays a really big part in my life now of how I see things how I change myself when I change myself others around me will change and that's what you really notice and you know it might have taken me quite a number of years because I was quite the opposite person I am today but I think also that my creativity and my glass it's the only thing that I do that's creative and I do it because of the beautiful light and the reflection and um, you know it's hard work <laughs> but it's enjoyable because when you love something you do it something that much you climb the earth to do it so probably for me one of the lessons I've learned in my life is that and what I want to do going forward with my solo next year is talking about I've taken the philosophy of when fallen leaves return to their roots that's a Chinese proverb so that usually means when people go back to the original roots so for me I'm using that as a metaphor for me returning turning back to what I love which is glass and it's really quite simple that's what also helped me in the wayfind program is that that helped me to realize that I can do this and I can start again at 60 <laughs> but that's fine I think about the possibilities you know um, but there are days when I go okay well that's going to be technically challenging and if it doesn't work it doesn't work and if you try first time it doesn't work you try a second and then you do a second time it doesn't work and do a third and if the third time like it doesn't work then you know that you've got to refocus review you know you've got you it's a constant thing it's kind of like you know anyone who casts like bronze or anything like that will understand because when glass flows into a mold technical challenges um there's the rate of flow into the mold there's all these things that can go wrong and it's probably the hardest medium to work in and it would have could have stopped me years ago after my first major stuff up but it didn't because I was determined so no no I'm gonna get this bloody pig out and I did for my first solo I mean there's a point where you have to go okay I can't do that I've tried it three times it's not working I've wasted you know 500 bucks on glass malt material I'm just gonna leave it write it down in my notes what happened what went wrong come back to it in another year or two or some other time when I get a light bulb moment and go oh, what if I what if I try it this way because you know either that or I just ask one of my colleagues who might be able to give me a little help it's very hard to give away technical information when you've done all this research yourself over the years you know and that's the whole part of develop yourself you keep doing things and doing things the same way to get the same result and then as soon as you start doing something different you've got to do some things differently so you get a different result so that's not always easy but you just sit there and say well damn this I've just got to do it because this is what I want to do and so you've got to put your whole heart and soul into even my fuck up yeah and when I'm creating I'm just like I can visualize what color I'm going to cast it and I'm going to visualize oh yeah and then I'm going to visualize all the cult working that takes hours and hours but I was kind of like that doesn't matter none of that matters the hard work doesn't matter when you do something like this you know you've got lots of counterparts out there you know lots of people and they're really famous you know they're really great at what they do and they make really huge work but I can't it's not that I can't make I just don't make big works a eh? because it's not the way that I like to tell my story I like to make small pieces that go together with the story so that the audience can see and they can feel and they can put the story together without me having to stand there and explain it it's like going to see an art exhibition with a painting and I can look at a painting and go oh yeah no matter how badly it's done if it's got color I love it color is just lights up everyone's world you know I mean you know orange is the new black orange is my favorite orange is my favorite color